God's been faithful. Amen. Amen. I'm, Kelsey made me sing this morning, so I'm raspy. I'm having to. Some uh, Rachel asked me at church, uh, lunch today. She said, "You're hoarse." I said, "Yeah, that's what happens when when Kelsey works me." But it's all good. We're going to uh, get started. Uh, but before we do, let me just remind you of what we got going on this week. And also, uh, I don't know that they've done a slide for our work day yet. But uh, you got me one? Okay. So prayer meeting tomorrow night here at the church at uh, 6. And then uh, we got that going on. And then Wednesday night we have our Bible studies with our uh, adult class. We're on the book of Revelation. And uh, we're working, I think we're going to the third, I think we're going to the third chapter this week. Uh, so uh, we're still working on the different epistles that uh, John wrote to the different churches. So we got that going on. And then on Wednesday night, we also have our kids class with Sister Sheila, our youth class with Tabitha, and our young adult class with Brother Major, Sister Rhonda. So I uh, encourage you to come out for classes on Wednesday night. Church cleanup, uh, work day here at the church on the 24th of February. That's uh, a week from this coming Sunday. Um, uh, why'd y'all say see Sister Rhonda if, you, if you'd like to help we want everybody to help so you don't have to see Sister Rhonda <clears throat> we just want you to show up and uh, we appreciate all the efforts we got some stuff that we're going to move we got some stuff we're going to throw away and we got some stuff that we're going to recycle so if you're an able body uh, we, we sure would appreciate the help uh, but that's going to start at 9 o'clock on the 24th which is a week from this coming Saturday and there's the nursery ministry schedule. All right. Uh, as I said earlier, we got quite a few folks that we're praying for and uh, believing God's going to touch them and minister to them. Um, continue to remember Fred. Uh, he is um, kind of locked in and, and no emotion, is uh, no movement in his face. Or his, uh, uh, they've rubbed his face, and he's not shown any response whatsoever. Uh, so he's, he's just um, uh, hanging on. So remember Fred and his wife, Ravina, uh, Jim and Sue, and all the family. Uh, continue to remember her brother, Steve, that God will continue to touch him and minister him. Uh, R- Ronnie, where'd Sheila go? Sheila, what, what's going on, Ronnie? Okay, all right. So we're, that's a possible surgery, testing aneurysm, possible. Okay. I'm, I was hitting my wife, but she ain't, she ain't catching me. Possible. Surgery. <clears throat> Dave, <laughs> uh, David Franklin, pray for him. Lou Amaru is doing some better. Uh, we thank the Lord for that, but continue to pray for him. Uh, he had a fall uh, yesterday, but uh, no concussion or anything, but uh, he's still fighting some sickness. Amanda's uh, still dealing with the issue in her neck, but she says she is doing better, so continue to remember her. Derek Livingston, continue to pray for him as he's fighting with cancer. Uh, Miss Violet, this is Stephanie's grandmother. We had a uh, did a prayer cloth for her this morning. Continue to pray and believe. Did they uh, put her on the machine today? D- they did put her on the machine. All right, so she's on life support. So remember Miss Violet. Uh, Aaron Cochran, uh, continue to remember him. Uh, Amy, uh, who's dealing with cancer. Continue to remember Edwin and Ginger as they're recovering from their surgeries. Uh, Amanda Paisley uh, and Matt, we continue to pray that God's going to give him good results on this uh, MRI and uh, whatever the issues are, that God just go and heal it. And uh, we're just believing God to do that. Uh, continue to remember the uh, Lynch family, uh, that God would strengthen them through this time with this uh, tragedy they dealt with. Mackenzie Harmon, uh, who was uh, with the ENT, so remember that, if you will, also. Next page, baby. There it is. Continue to remember Betty Smith, uh, the Carver family. They've had, they've had a, a Tammy and her husband both passed away in the last couple of weeks. So remember that family. Uh, continue to remember Kim. She's still in the hospital. Uh, it's probably going to be a few more days that she's got to be in there. Same thing with Joe. Uh, they're thinking maybe Wednesday he might get to come home. So remember him. Lane is doing some better from the flu, uh, but uh, just dealing with the cough. Caleb, same thing. He's getting over the flu, but uh, dealing with the cough. Continue to remember Tony Bowles. He's uh, recovering from the heart surgery. He, he did have it this past week, what Mike told us, but uh, pray for his recovery. Continue to remember Jerry. Uh, just praying for this, God to heal this kidney, uh, that God would touch and minister him. Uh, also, continue to remember Michael and Carmen. They're both sick. Uh, they're just passing around this sickness at their house. So remember them, if you will. Remember Jobin, uh, who's dealing with the flu and pneumonia. Also, Sharon, this 15-year-old, is doing numbness on her side. They found something on her brain. Not sure what that is, but praying for the Lord to touch her. Uh, Joe and Huss is scheduled for kidney removal on Wednesday. Uh, Adam's dealing with the uh, flu, so remember him. 
and Charlotte Hout, who's dealing with thyroid issues. Uh, Sister Helen uh, gave us that request this morning. And also Joseph uh, Gavin. I, I said Gavin, G-A-V-I-N. Uh, remember Joseph, uh, the, remember his family. Uh, he was uh, the victim of a hit and run. He passed away, and they've got the memorial service coming up for him. Uh, also, Mike McFarland was in the hospital for a, a few days. Um, he's losing blood as a result of the cancer, his esophageal cancer. Uh, they, they were um, giving him blood. They gave him a transfusion yesterday, but he did get to go home today. So uh, just continue to remember Mike, that God will continue to touch him and uh, heal his body and uh, make a way in his life. So if you would, uh, pray for him also. Uh, I ask you also to pray for my, my mom and dad uh, as they're traveling this week. Uh, that God would touch them and minister to him. Kelsey's not feeling well tonight. Um, she's just feeling kind of puny, so remember her. Sister Janet was here this morning, but at the end of service, she was saying that she was feeling uh, bad again, so she's at home, so remember Sister Janet. Uh, Kat is also at home. She sent us a message that she woke up from her nap and uh, was feeling a little poor, and so uh, remember Kat. She's uh, at home also. She said she'd be watching online, so I'm telling you, we just... Need to be careful. We're sharing the love around this place. Need to make sure we share the right kind of love, the love of Jesus, not the love of the flu. Amen? <laughs> so uh, let's pray. Uh, uh, Terry wants us to thank the Lord. They've moved. Sandra, she came out of the critical care unit off life support. They've got her at the uh, um, Lincoln Nursing Center doing rehab now. She's sitting up. She's talking. And so we thank the Lord for, that he's doing that in her life. And um, Terry said he just thanks God that... Uh, She's doing well. Missed it. Okay. I had the flu. Okay. There's a lot of that stuff going around. Mr. Boggs, is it, he's, at the, he's at the nursing home, yeah. We've been praying for him at our prayer meeting, so remember, remember Mr. Boggs that God would touch him and see him. Amen. God's faithful. Amen. God is faithful. If you would, let's stand up. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer together. And uh, we're going to jump right into it tonight. Appreciate all of you being here. Appreciate our visitors being with us tonight. It always makes it nice when uh, uh, when our people can't be here. People come in and fill their spaces. And so God, we just appreciate you guys being here. Well, y'all ain't visitors. Y'all family. So, <laughs> so uh, we just appreciate y'all coming out and worship with us tonight. We're just looking forward to a good time of the Lord. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here tonight. So let's pray together and ask God to have his way. Would you pray that God will give me the strength and the ability to do what I need to do tonight as far as bringing the word? And uh, pray God would just help us all just to, to uh, learn of him and uh, grow closer to him tonight and to learn what it is that we're called to do in the place we're called to be. So let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for the opportunity once again that you've given us to come into your house. Thank you, God, that your word is true. And God, that uh, the things that you speak, shall come to pass, God, the words that you've declared over our lives, the words that you've spoken. I pray tonight, God, that you would help us as we go through this time of the service, God, that you would help us just to, to learn of you and to grow in, in, in your presence, your power, and all that you do, God. I pray, God, that you would help uh, those on our list and those that have been mentioned across this room, God, that are battling with this sickness, this flu, uh, this pneumonia, all this stuff that's going around right now. We pray, God, that you would heal them and protect us. God, from this, from this sickness, God, we, we, we don't really want this stuff. And so, God, we're just asking you to protect. And, God, that you would guard us and help us, God, to be what you call us to be. Father, I surrender all that I am and all that I desire to be. I give it to you tonight. I pray, God, that you would uh, minister to those that are dealing with cancer, those that are recovering from surgeries, God, that you would heal their bodies and make them whole, those that are traveling. I pray, God, that you administer them in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for Roger. I know that he's been dealing with a uh, little bit of sickness, God, and trying to get over it before he has to go back to work. And I just pray, God, that you would heal him and make him whole tonight in Jesus' name. Touch Jerry, God, to heal this tumor in this kidney, God. I pray that you would cause that kidney to begin to function at its full capacity, God, and that you would cause this tumor to dissolve in the name of Jesus. Father, we're believing you to do that. Touch Miss Violet tonight, God, as they've placed her on... Uh, Life support, Mr. Boggs, God, as he's under hospice care, and Miss Betty, God, as she's under hospice care, God, that you would minister to Fred tonight, God, and Steve, and minister to these families, God, and touch them and strengthen them as they're on this journey, uh, God, dealing with these family members that are, are just really fighting for their life. I just pray, God, that you would manifest your glory and your presence, your, your power, God, that you can do. Father, I thank you again for the opportunity to come in your house, the opportunity, Lord, to be what you call us to be, to surrender all that we are. I give you the praise. 
the glory and the honor for these things. For everything that's done tonight, we'll be sure to give you the praise, God, the glory and the honor. We will praise you and bless your name, for you are worthy of it all. And we glorify you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. I know you may have already done it. Go ahead, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. We had a few folks that walked in a few minutes late. Take a minute here before you're seated and uh, shake somebody's hand. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Uh, just take a moment of fellowship. Come on, y'all run me some water. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, folks, let's get right back into the Word. Praise God. We need to set time limits on this. Just teasing. All right, folks. We're going to jump right back into the Word. If you would, would you stand for just a moment? Uh, I'm going to take you back to our text, but we're going to pick up where we left off uh, from this morning. For those of you that were not here this morning, uh, it's going to be the same but different. Uh, we, we've been talking about life in the Spirit this morning. We talked about uh, our, our speech and protecting our speech as, as we are Spirit-filled people, that uh, the requirement of us, the the obligation of us to be able to uh, stand before people in this world on our jobs and our homes and in different faculties of how we uh, operate, that we, we're very protective about what we say because the Scripture said we'll give account for every idle word that we speak. And so this, this morning we talked a lot about the personal speech and how we talk personally, but tonight I want to take you a little bit deeper through the Scriptures as it, as it pertains to what we do within the church the, the, the order that's within the church, uh, the order of how we speak and who's to speak, when you're to speak, when you're not to speak, and uh, because all that is Spirit-led. Amen. All that's led of the Spirit, and so we, we want to make sure that we're in order as it pertains to the Scripture. I know that there's uh, a lot of people that are new to church. There's a lot of people that are here that are probably new to Pentecost. Maybe there's some things that goes on in the service you might not quite understand, or maybe there's some things that you, you, you just wonder. But I, I'll tell you this. What I have learned is that when God's in it, He bears witness with us, and, and there's confirmation of what God has said and what God is doing, and God will bring it to pass, and it will be for His glory. Amen? For our benefit. <laughs> Praise God. So let's go back to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. We're going to read down through the fourth verse, and and uh, we're just going to pick right up with the last two verses of the text, uh, uh, verse 3 and verse 4, uh, kind of where we left off this morning. So the Bible said, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Then appear, there appeared to them divided tongues or cloven tongues like as of fire, and, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Again, we're continuing our series, Life in the Spirit, but more specifically tonight, talking about talking in the Spirit. So, Father, I pray again that you would help me, give me the strength, the ability to do what I need to do. God, that we can glean from your word, be more effective as a church body, more effective for what you call us to do. Father, we give you the praise, the glory, and honor for what's about to be accomplished. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. You may be seated. I will, I will probably, uh, Lord willing, I, and just to kind of give you a heads up, the direction I'll probably go for next Sunday, if God gives me the opportunity. Uh, you know, what we do here in church and why we bring forth the word and the teaching and the worship and all the things that we do, 
the scripture teaches us about the fivefold ministry of the church. And that fivefold ministry is apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. But the Bible said that God has given them to the church for the perfecting of the saints for the working of the ministry. So what we do when we come together is, is we're coming together for the purpose that I work in the office as pastor as God has called me to, to equip you and perfect you and help you to be more effective for the working of the ministry. So if you, if you take that scripture, and again, we'll, we'll dig into that deeper next week as, as the Lord allows. But as you begin to look at what we're talking about, this life in the Spirit, about walking in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, talking in the Spirit, how these things are helping you to be more effective for the work of the kingdom, for the work of the ministry, uh, for, the, for the saving of souls, for, people to, for, for the deliverance of those that are bound, for setting free uh, those that are in prison, that God would equip you as the body of Christ to be effective for the kingdom of God. And I don't know about you, but that's what I want to be. I want to be effective in the role that God has called me to. My role, it it, it may be titled different in your role. It might might be position-wise within the local church body different in your role, but we all have a role to play as it pertains to the kingdom of God. And God is equipping us with the power of the Spirit of God. God is equipping us to do the work that God has called us to do. Every person in this room has a job to do in the kingdom. God has purposed your life. The Bible talks about how that he calls your end from the beginning. When creation took place, God already knew that you'd be here in 2018 for the specific purpose to do what you're called to do and to be able to be elevated within the kingdom to do the things that God has anointed you to do for, for direct purposes of the kingdom. God has uniquely placed you where you are to do the things that you're doing and to be around the people that you're around to have a direct effect on them because God has called you to be salt. God has called you to be light and he's empowered you with the Holy Ghost to teach you and guide guide you and show you the things that you need on an everyday basis. The Holy Ghost is not just for Sunday services. The Holy Ghost is not just for worship services. The Holy Ghost empowers you to be effective for the kingdom of God. And when we begin to understand that when we walk in the fullness of the power of God, when we're filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, when we walk in the fullness of God, that we can begin to see the results that they saw in the early days, in the church days, in the, in the first of the church days, the Bible days, the things that we read about we can begin to see to come to pass in our life. I don't know about you, but I want to have the kind of walk with God like Peter had, where the Bible said they would take the sick and lay them out on their cots on the side of the street, and as Peter would pass by, his shadow would cast upon them, and the the sick would get up whole, and the dead were raised, and they saw miracle after miracle after miracle because they walked with the fullness of the power of God. That's the desire that I have for me. That's the desire I have for you, that you can be filled with with the Spirit. Remember, we talked about it this morning. When you're filled, there's no more room for anything else. Amen. When you're filled and full, you know, we, we sat down to eat lunch today. We sat down to eat lunch today, and, and, and I was talking about how hungry I was, and I fixed my plate. And when I finished, when I finished eating, I, I, I said, man, I'm, I'm just full. And uh, Rachel, Abby, one of them picked that, and they said, they said, you know, just a moment ago, he's talking about how hungry he is. Now he's talking about how full he is. Well, well that's, that's, that's what good cooking will do for you. Are you with me? When, when you got good cooking and good food, you get full. I, I, I didn't leave hungry, but I got filled. When I come to the house of God, and I've expended all my spiritual energy and I've, and I've done what I'm supposed to do through the week. When I come to God, I come here knowing that this place is a filling station. That this is a place where I can come and get filled with the Spirit of God and be filled with the opportunity to go back into the world and preach the gospel with my life, with my words, with my actions, to present the gospel of Jesus Christ so that people that are lost might be saved. That's what it's all about. To be effective for the kingdom of God. So the Bible tells us, and I'm going to jump up to John 20, 22, Tracy. The Bible said that Jesus assembles his disciples and he has a conversation with them. And after he talks to them, the Bible said when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And so Jesus desires to breathe upon the people of God to have us to walk again in the fullness of of the Holy Ghost. God wants you to be filled with His power. 
I cannot stress that enough tonight to help you to understand that it's not, again, it's not just so we shout better in church or we dance better in church or we worship better in church or we amen louder in church. It's about equipping you. Remember, the Bible said, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. It is equipping you for the perfecting of your life so that you can work the ministry and be effective for the kingdom of God. So Jesus breathed on his disciples. Remember, the Greek word here is pneuma. It means the breath of God, the wind of God, the outpouring of God's presence, his power. That same suddenly sound of the rushing mighty wind that came in Acts chapter 2 that began to move upon these people and cloven tongues of fire sat upon each and every one of them and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit began to give them the utterance. And so the Bible tells in Mark 16 and 17 that these signs will follow those who believe. He said, in my name they will cast out demons and they will speak with new tongues. Now, I, I, just to tie it all together, This morning we talked about the full submission, the evidence of full submission when you have yielded your tongue to God. We talked about the fact that it's a fiery member, that it's set on fire of hell, James tells us. That if we could surrender our tongue to God, that God would have control of the whole body. James even said, if a man can tame his tongue, he has control of the whole body. James said in James 1.26, he said, If a person bridles not his tongue, but yet seems to be religious, but cannot bridle his tongue or keep himself in check, then his religion is in vain. It's useless. It doesn't matter how high you shout. It doesn't matter how much you dance. It doesn't matter how many hallelujahs you throw out in the church service. If you cannot control your tongue, if you cannot control your tongue, all that is in vain. <coughs> so, Let's go back to the text. Acts chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 3, Then there appeared to them divided tongues or cloven tongues like as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. Every one of them, God began to pour out his presence on them. Every one of them, God began to initiate a move of his spirit and his power in their life. Every one of them at that moment were being equipped for service unto God. At that moment, the Bible said that they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Now, I know, and and, and there's always been some confusion about this. There's always been some, some teaching and theology about this. So before I go any further, I want to stop right here and use this one verse of Scripture, verse 4. I want to use this one verse of Scripture to teach you a principle. It is God through the Holy Ghost that speaks through His people. Are you with me? It is us surrendered to Him, and as God desires to speak, and we're surrendered to Him, God speaks through His people. So it is God that gives the utterance. I don't control it. I don't have manipulate, manipulative powers over it. Oh, listen, I could stammer in tongues. Most of you know I was an auctioneer before I started preaching. And so I can rattle off some words. I mean, I could pull them together and, and make you sit and go, wow, look at all these string of words that he pulled together. Listen, I could do something that could mimic and mock tongues. But I'll tell you something. When the genuine power of the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you don't have control of it. You can't manipulate it. You can't pull it together for your own power or in your flesh. It is God, always will be God, always has been God. And it is God that gives the utterance. And so we we understand that God gave them the ability supernaturally at this particular point in time in Acts chapter 2. He gave them supernatural ability to speak in languages that they had no control over or that they had never learned. In Acts chapter 2 beginning at verse 8, the, the, the people that were in the crowd began to ask the question, How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Let me stop here for just a moment. When you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you're testifying of the goodness of God, The Bible teaches us that when God begins to speak through you, you are witnesses of Jesus Christ. 
It is a wonderful work of God. It is a wonderful work of the gospel that God would declare through you to the lost to the burden, to the overwhelmed, to the people that are hurting. God will speak through you the wonderful works of God that it might not be clear to you, but it will be very clear to the one that you're speaking to. Look what they're saying here. They say we come from all these backgrounds. We've got all these diversity of languages that are here. But we're hearing them speak in our own language the wonderful works of God. Verse 12 says, so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? The scripture teaches us that 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 speaking with the Holy Ghost, it edifies the body of God and it is a sign to the unbeliever. It is a sign to the unbeliever. The, The sign that was presented to these folks on that day is that God has the ability to take unlearned, ignorant men and women and speak through them with great power to the point that God could turn it around and people will come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Listen to this Pentecostal preacher. I love to shout. I love to dance. I I wish God would just give us a gully washer service every time we come together. I would to God that we'd all leave here with our hairs messed up and, and, and our clothes all wrinkled and, and, and sweat and snot running down our face because we just have one of them slobber knocker services. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you've been around Pentecost, oh, about two years, you know what I'm talking about. Just one of them services where we all just, we're trying to figure out who's going to drive home. Those good services, you're praying they don't have a DUI checkpoint at the end of the road. So you get out and start talking to him, and you're not talking in English because the Holy. I'm talking about a good slobber. I would to God that we'd have those kind of services on a regular basis. It'd be all right with me. But if that's all it is, we've missed it. I love to shout like the best of them. Boy, I love to get in the middle of it. If it's an outpouring of God, I want to be right in the middle of what God's doing. But if all I'm doing is making it entertainment value, Rather than equipping value, I've missed the mark. God wants us to understand that when we come and we shout and we dance, we worship, that we are shaking off chains and we're shaking off things that bind and we're putting the devil in his place and letting him know that we're not backing down from the kingdom of God, but we're pressing forward to the mark of the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus, and we're not backing down. Listen, friend, what does it mean when we come and worship? You're telling the devil, devil, you tried your best to knock me down this week, but I'm still going to praise God. You tried your best to stop me, but I'm still going to praise God. Sister Rhonda told me this morning, I said, how you doing? She said, the devil tried to make me stay home, but I'm here. You know what she did? She shot the devil right in the eye this morning. She let the devil know, devil, you're not stopping me. I'm telling you, that's what I worship is saying to the world and to the enemy, give me your best shot, but as for me and my house, we're still going to serve the Lord. That's the understanding of why we come together and why we do what we do. I don't come in here to put on a show for you. I got a real devil that's got a real hell and real demonic power that when I leave the freedom of this anointing, he's going to hit me when I walk out the door and try to stop me again. But greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. I'm telling you, friend, you come and get equipped. You come, this is like basic training. You're getting yourself equipped for war. You're getting yourself equipped for battle. You're learning the techniques. You're learning the Word of God. You're learning how to fight. You're learning how to be vigilant. You're learning how to be more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ that loved you so that when you get equipped with the power of God, you walk into that world and you're light in that darkness. You're salt and preservative to that which is being corrupted. God is helping you to be effective for the kingdom of God so they were all perplexed they said what what in the world does all this mean and so Peter stands up and begins to proclaim the word of God to them and as he preaches the word the Bible said that 3,000 souls were added to the church that day 3,000 souls with the preaching of the first message on the day of Pentecost wow it's the birth of the church folks 
It's the onset of something great and grand that Jesus prophesied, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let me tell you something. We've been learning this in our study of the book of Revelation. There's been a lot of ups and downs in church history. There's been a lot of dark days in church history. There's been some bright moments where the revival has come in and chains have been broken and things have happened. Listen, I'm ta talking about just back in Bible days, but if you go throughout church history, you'll see some magnificent moves of God. But I'll tell you this, just like it started on the day of Pentecost, it didn't start on the day of Pentecost. It started days before because people began to pray and intercede and worship and get their hearts in a place that they could come in one mind and one accord. Every revival I've ever studied that's ever taken place, it didn't just happen because they got a, a good evangelist or a good preacher to come and good singers to sing. No, friend. It, got, it happened because in the burden of somebody's heart, God put a mind of prayer and they begin to see God's face for an outpouring of God's presence. I'm telling you, friend, some of the greatest revivals we've ever seen in this world happened because somebody sought the face of God and God moved on behalf of their prayer. These guys on the day of Pentecost, we read about it and we get excited about it, but we don't know the preparatory work that took place to get them to that place. The Welsh revival that took place in Wales in the 1400s took place simply because a man went into the woods and began to seek the face of God. And before you know it, other people began to feel the burden of God and began to go out in the woods and pray with them. And one of the greatest revivals that ever took place in that land took place because one man decided it's time to go pray. Are you with me? Listen, it, it happens, folks. It happens because people come together and pray. So they're asking the question, whatever could this mean? You know, it's interesting to me. Again, the, the Bible talks about how tongues are assigned to the unbeliever. But it's interesting to me how the, that, that, that with that, God always piques the curiosity. Because people are curious. You know, it, it, you know my, my dad was a fireman. And it always amazed me. We'd be going to a fire somewhere, and you look behind, behind you, and people want to follow you because they want to see what's going on. People are curious. You know, you see flashing lights. I, we call them rubberneckers on the, on the interstate because they see flashing lights, and it could be, it could be uh, you know, over, over six lanes of traffic on the other side, and they're slowing down on this side just to look and see what's going on because people are curious. I mean, you know, I, I, I drove down the interstate and saw fires off of the interstate and, and the traffic on the interstate backing up because everybody wanted to see what that was that was burning or smoking over there. There is a natural curiosity within the world when things are different or things are strange. Oh, God, help me preach right here. We are called to be peculiar people. We're called to be strange and different. We're called to be sanctified and set apart. We're called to be on fire. So when the world sees us, I don't know what that means, but it's making me take a pause and begin to look and, to, and, and try to divulge what it is that I'm seeing. I'm perplexed. I'm amazed at what I'm seeing. How that somebody of natural distinct, can, uh, distinction can have such supernatural ability. What is it about them? Listen, friend, that's why the church should be a firebrand in this dark, dying world that we're a part of because what they need to see is the difference that the church is and what makes the difference in the church is the power of the Holy Ghost. He sets us on fire with the power of God so that the world will see that we're different. I wish we get a log jam on Industrial Park Road of people riding by saying, what's going on at that place right there? You say, preacher, you done lost your mind. I lost it a long time ago, folks. I'm telling you, God wants to set us afire. God wants to work inside of us as a corporate unit, as a body of believers. But even in what seems to be organized chaos sometimes when it comes to the move of the Holy Ghost in a church service, there's still a decency and an order that God has called us to. So let me back up and just make I'm going to get started on something else. So the distinction of what Peter was dealing with here, and, and again, God empowers us and emboldens us with the power of the Holy Ghost so that we can declare the works of God. Remember, how is it that we hear these people speaking in our own language the wonderful works of God? Listen, God wants to give you a word that has understanding and meaning so that you can speak it in somebody's life that it can be changed. Again, I value and I appreciate and I covet the opportunity to have a time of prayer 
of, 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 of intercession with God, even when I don't know what I should be praying, that the Holy Ghost would make groanings and utterings which cannot be understood. I'm thankful that God allows me in my prayer time, my personal prayer time, even in preaching sometimes, the Holy Ghost moves on me, that, 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 that he'll speak through me with tongues and, and, and even an unknown tongue. It's not to be interpreted, but it's just the power of God moving on us and ministering through us and edifying the individual. But it's not edifying to you if I just stand up here and speak in tongues all the time. Peter, the Bible said that after this experience of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible said, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Now look what he's doing here. Peter is speaking in a language, even though he's filled with the Spirit, he's speaking in a language that they're going to understand. It's clear to the people what he's about to address. There's no confusion about it whatsoever. Within the body of Christ, if we're not careful, we'll begin to do things out of zealousness and zeal that will bring more confusion than it will clarity. And we can hinder people from having a deeper relationship in God. We can also be so spiritually minded and so zealous of good works that we set such a high bar that all of a sudden people will say, I'll never be that spiritual. You may not want to be that spiritual or religious. Are you with me? I, I, I believe in one word when it comes to church, and that's balance. I believe God wants balance in our lives. I believe God wants us to understand that he brings balance to our lives, that he keeps us on an even keel, that there's things that God does and works in our life and how he ministers to us and through us that it brings balance to our lives. It brings stability. Listen, when the, when the boat is rocking and the storms are popping out on the outside and everything seems to be out of control, God wants you to have balance. He doesn't want the world causing you to teeter-totter or get off balance. He wants you to maintain your balance. Listen, that's what the Holy Ghost does. It will bring balance to your life. The Holy Ghost will move and minister your life and help you to have stability. Listen, remember what Paul said. I mean, David said. David said, he's brought me up out of the horrible pit, even out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he established my goings. What was David saying? David said, my God brought me up out of sin. He brought me up out of an unstable place, and he placed me in a place of stability. He placed me in a place of balance, so that when storms come, Jesus said, he said, there's a wise man that built his house on a rock, and an unwise man that built his house on the sand. He said when the storm came and the winds began to blow the house that was on the rock it stood. Why? Because it had stability. But great was the destruction of the house that was on the sand. What are you saying preacher? I'm saying get yourself found in the rock Christ Jesus. Find yourself filled with the Holy Ghost. Find your stability in God and no matter what the world throws at you, no matter what the devil throws at you, you have the ability to stand and know with the confidence that God is for you and if God is for you Nobody can be against you. I come to declare a word to you tonight to stand on the rock, stand on the Lord, and allow God to move in your life. So he spoke to them. And the Bible said in Acts 4:31, after this great message that Peter spoke, they began to pray. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Listen, when you're filled with Him, when you're filled with the Spirit of God, you can declare the Word of God and you don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to worry about what people might feel. You, listen, when you declare the Word of God, the Word of God will do the work that the Word of God needs to do. And with boldness, you can proclaim it. I'm not going to lie to you. There's been times that I've gotten in this pulpit and I looked across the crowd and I see people that are out there and I'm thinking, Joy, you know you got this one point that God gave you that you need to make. You might want to be careful making that point there because you don't want to offend somebody. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stand here and act like you tell you like I got it all together. There's days I wrestle with that. There's days that I wrestle with, 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 with declaring that truth with boldness. I know it's truth. I know that truth has set them free. I know that truth, but but how are they gonna respond? It is not my responsibility. How you respond to the Word of God. It is my responsibility is to sow seed 
and in the seed sowing business, you find good ground, you find thorny ground, you find rocky soil, you find de- uh, uh, dense soil, but all of it, you just sow and seed. The one thing that I learned when Jesus told the parable of the seed sower, the seed sower, he just threw seed. He didn't get hindered by where he was throwing. The Bible said he just threw it. It landed on all kinds of ground, landed on all kinds of soil, but that seed that fell on good ground brought forth good fruit. I'm telling you, friends, we got to do what we're called to do, and when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you can declare that word of God with boldness because you know you've been equipped, you know you've been called, you know you've been appointed, you know that you've been anointed because the Holy Ghost rests on your life and God is helping you through all the series of life that you're going through. God will equip you. The Bible said when they prayed, the place where they were was shaken. Let me, let me, let me throw this scripture in there. Jesus talked about how in the last days he would shake the things that needed to be shaken. And the things that couldn't be shaken, that's what would, be, would remain. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he's saying. There's a shaking coming, folks. The people that are unsteady, the people that are unstable, the people that just can't get it, they can't seem to make their mind up, I'm telling you, there's coming a day that that, 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 that lack of steadiness is going to cause them to falter and they're going to miss the mark. Are you with me? There's a lot of instability in the church today. People don't know what to believe. Number one, because they don't study it for themselves. People don't know what to believe. They're hearing, they're hearing all kinds of things because they're digesting. Listen, you better be careful who you let speak in your life. Are you with me? Because it can bring instability to your life. So to understand that first and foremost, you need to allow the Word of God to be prominent in your life to allow the Word of God to, to, to be first and foremost in your life. And so the Bible said that when, when, when they were in the place that they were assembled together, that it was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. Let me ask you a question. How many of you in here have to fight the devil? All right. We have to fight the devil. So, so Peter, the Bible said in, in, in Acts chapter 13, or Saul, let me back up. Saul, who also is called Paul, Acts 13, 9 and 10, filled with the Holy Spirit, Looked at him intently. Now, he's dealing with Elamus here. He, he says, O fool of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Look, now, now, now Paul is filled with the Holy Ghost. He's dealing with a sorcerer, a, a, a wicked man, a devil, if you will. And he speaks intently to him. It's about time. Can, can I... Can I just say it like I want to say it right here? It's about time that the church quit pacifying people. It's about time that the church quit trying to, you know, be PC and politically correct. It's time for us to speak with intent. Paul spoke with intent. It's time for us as people of God to speak with intent. Listen, well, preacher, you know, you ain't going to get a lot of people coming if you start speaking intentionally. I'm not in this thing to grow big crowds. I'm here to speak truth. With intention. So the Bible said that he spoke with intent and he dealt with the issue that was at hand specifically right then. He called him what he was. He said what it was by the truth of God's word and he dealt with the issue. Listen, this is what the boldness of the Holy Ghost will do for you. The boldness of the Holy Ghost will give you boldness. It will give you intent. It will give you purpose. And it's something that you don't have to back down from. This is why the Bible tells us that we should be filled with the Spirit of God, to be continually filled with God's Spirit. And so God is, is helping us to understand that. So, so let's, let's get into the, the church issues for just a moment. Not issues, but clarification. Let's put it that way. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. They begin to list these different facets of ministry that the Holy Ghost, that God begins to do through the Holy Ghost. Now, let me back up for just a moment and tell you this. Paul is writing this letter to the Corinthian church because the Corinthian church has gotten caught up in what people like to determine, or uh, as terminology to say, that it was wildfire. It was chaos. There was nothing in order about their church services. People were just standing up and speaking in tongues like they wanted to. People were just standing up and giving words of prophecy like they wanted to. There was no decency. There was no order. And it was bringing a lot of confusion. There was heresy coming into the church because people were, people were the Bible talks about the women that were being led away by people that were uh, uh, bringing heresy. And they would come back in and bring these teachings into the church. I mean, it even got to the point that Paul finally had to say, you know, don't let a woman even teach in the church. Because they were being deceived by these, these heresies, these false teachings and they were bringing them back into the church. And Paul said, you know, we're going to put a stop to this. 
And so he, he's dealing with all these issues within the Corinthian church. And so in, in, in this 12th chapter, he says, Now, brother, concerning spiritual gifts, I would not have you to be ignorant. He does not want us to be ignorant as it pertains to the spiritual gifts. You know, with, with, within the church, there's, there's a lot of people, they don't want to deal with this subject because it's easier just to kind of gloss over it and move on to chapter 13 where we talk about love than it is to actually deal with the, the, the working mechanism within the church. You know, that'd be like having a car that's broke down or a car that's smoking all the time. And you say, well, it gets me from point A to point B. I'll, I'll deal with the smoke issue later. Are you with me? You know? That's like having a stove and you're trying to cook a full course meal and you only got one eye on the stove working. You say, well, I'll, I'll fix those burners later. I'll just work with this one eye right here. It's foolishness. So, so within the church, we need to understand that there's capacity of gifts within the church that are available to every Holy Ghost filled believer that's in that church. Are you with me? If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, the operation of the gifts of the Spirit are available to you. And the scripture said that God gives to men severally as he wills. I talked about that a little bit this morning. The scripture talks about how that, that God does not want us to be ignorant about these things. But listen, they are given to us to equip us to again be effective as a body of Christ for the kingdom of God. And so he goes through this list. And in, in 1 Corinthians 12, beginning with verse 10, he says, I give to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one of the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. You know, again, I, I, I'm, I'm just based on Scripture, okay? But I, I get real scared when people start saying, I have the gift of. I, I get real nervous when people start saying, I have the gift of. I, it, they're not my gifts. They're not your gifts. They're his gifts that he gives as he wills. You know, so, so if you're in a situation and, 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 and the, the gift of miracles is needed, then the Holy Spirit will move in and work through you with the gift of miracles. If a word of wisdom is needed, God will work in. And, and I could go through the whole list. What, whatever's needed in that particular time, God knows what you have need of even before you ask it. So he has the way to move in your situation and give to you and teach you and show you and help you and equip you for the situation at his hand. So he says, listen, I give to one these different gifts and I give to them as I will. So look what he says in 1 Corinthians. Keep going. Let's go down to verse 28. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. So Paul is telling the Corinthian church, says, listen, when God works, you don't have a possession of, not everybody has the possession of the gift of healing. Or, or, or the distribution of the saints, or, or, or the gift of health. You know, God divides that stuff up in the body for a particular reason. Come here, Caleb. <laughs> now, I know my tall, lanky nephew looks like he's all arms and legs. I'll just go ahead and tell you, there's not a green bean in this boy's body. He's right now filled with chicken casserole. Because that's probably all he ate for lunch. Am I right? You have macaroni? You the man, baby. Way to, way to step out there. Way to step out there. Broaden your horizons a little bit. But if I would have called my nephew Caleb up here and said, Caleb, would you come up here and stand beside me? And all of a sudden, all you saw was a six foot four arm, that would look pretty weird. I'm trying to work with you here. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to you know, not get into words that I don't need to be saying. It's, but you're making it difficult. <laughs> the Bible talks about if the whole body were an ear, where would be the seeing? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If I called my nephew up here and all of a sudden he, he looked like one singular body part, that would be pretty weird. And, and God is creating him. Listen, even if he were just one body part and I would have said, Caleb, I need you to come up here. He wouldn't have been able to make it. He wouldn't have been able to get up and walk around the chairs and come up here and stand here and flex for you 
like he did. Are you with me? Because he would have been limited to one faculty that actually needs other faculties of his body to operate in unity. Not uniformity, unity. Uniformity would have been like I would have had him bound up, tied up, legs, feet, and everything, and everything's moving forward all at one time. That's uniformity. God doesn't call us. He said how blessed and beautiful it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, not uniformity. That means we're different. There's difference about us. When Caleb come walking around and, and he got that body frame going and doing like he needed to do, one arm was going forward, one arm was going back, one foot was going forward while the other foot was trailing and coming back and forward. Listen, it was all working the way it was supposed to work. His head was turning left to right. Make sure you weren't looking and laughing at him. Make sure he wasn't going to trip over himself and make a fool of himself walking across the church. He was doing everything he could to find himself. His brain was working and thinking to himself, what does he call me up for? He's probably going to embarrass me. Why is he bringing me up there? He's going, I, I, I love my Uncle Joy, but Lord have mercy, he gets on my nerves sometimes. His brain was operating. Everything was doing while everything was moving forward. Are you with me? We are the body of Christ. We all have different functions. It would have been funny today if I watched Caleb over there with his plate of half a plate of chicken casserole that he had, if he had no arms or hands, and he was sitting there trying to feed himself with his feet and trying to shove it in his mouth. He was thankful for his hands today. When the body's working the way the body's supposed to work. Now listen, we, we've all been there. You, you ever walk through your house when it's dark at night and stumped your toe? Something about that stumped toe makes everything hurt. It'll make a grown man cry. Are you with me? I mean, you go through there and you hit that one, that one body part begins to hurt, and it affects everything else in the body. This is why we come together in unity. This is why the scripture teaches us when one's weeping, we weep with him. When one rejoices, we rejoice with him. You know, th th this is what the body is all about. And so Paul is teaching the Corinthian church, listen, we've got to operate in body. It might not look uniform, but it works together, and all it works together to move the body forward. So he says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning his gifts. I'm equipping you as the body. I'm equipping you to move you forward in the power of God and to be effective when you move. Now, I called Caleb up here, and it took him all of probably five, ten seconds to get up here. If I'd have called Miss Helen, it probably took her a little longer. She's shorter. Legs are shorter. And so the, the capacity for her to make her way up here would have taken her a little bit longer than it did for Caleb to get up here. So, so e even in our limitations, God gives us the ability that in our weakness, his strength is perfected, and yet we still move forward. Are you with me? So in our shortcomings within the body, God does these things. So thank you, Caleb. So, so, so we see these things, and we understand that God wants us to work in unity. Again, that doesn't always happen to way. Listen. I remember when Caleb was born, when Caleb was born, you know, and, 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 and Paula, her, her oldest child, when Paula gave birth to him, she brought him home, and he was squalling his head off because that's what he did. Am I right? Pretty much 23, 59, something along in there. Uh, you, know, we, we, you know, she didn't just sit him in the floor and he'd jump up and say, hey. I remember when he started trying to walk. I remember my girl started trying to walk. You know, they had to figure that thing out, how this foot works here and how that, and sometimes they're doing like this and they plop down on the diaper. Am I right? And you stand them back up and say, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Come on. And we're holding out our arms and they're going. We laugh at that, but that's what a lot of church folks look like. Because we're trying to get them to understand they're wanting to get out and run a race and they're still trying to figure out how to walk. And this is where the work into the body comes in is that when one's weak, the other is strong and we work together. And unity comes to the body and God moves in unity. And so how, how does all this happen? So Paul's having to address these very serious issues. Paul's having to address these and deal with these issues as it pertains to the Corinthian church but also speaking to us today. So... 
He's going to show us a more excellent way. Now, he, he skips after chapter 12, and he goes to chapter 13. He's talking about love, talking about without love, we're nothing, we're a sounding brass tickling symbol. But then he goes right back into teaching on the gifts. And I want to walk very quickly through this chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 14. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me, or you can look on the screen. I think I've got them all up there. But we're going to walk through this very quickly, okay? Uh, and, and when I say very quickly, I'm going to have to do it quick because I think there's about 40 verses in this, in this chapter. Buckle up, folks. Here we go. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. All right? So, so when we come in church, we come in church and we're, we're gathered together. And, and, and boy, we're having a good shouting time. And people are jumping up and they're speaking in tongues. And, and boy, we're having a good old time. The Bible said that when we come together, we need to love one another, desire the gifts, but especially that we can utter words that are of understanding. If, if I come up to Matt, and, and I'm wanting to tell Matt that I love him, but I'm stammering in some kind of tongue. Matt's going to go, that's nice. But if I look at Matt and say, man, God loves you, and I do too, that has an effect on Matt. It makes him feel warm and bubbly on the inside. The preacher loves me, and God does too. You pursue love, and you desire these gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. God, give me a word. Give me something, God, that I can speak into somebody's life that I can make. A difference. And so he, he's, he's dealing with this. He said, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. So if you just jump up and start speaking in tongues, and then you sit back down, the only person that's benefited is you. If you stand up and declare a word from God, and all of a sudden you're on this side declaring a word from God, and this person over here was just praying and saying, God, I'd really like to get a word from you, and you speak without knowledge of their situation, and you're speaking directly to their situation, and they jump and say, thank you, Jesus. You've spoken to my life. That makes a difference in the body of Christ. But again, as I told you this morning, people are uncomfortable with that because you're held accountable by the body. It's easy to jump up and speak in tongues because nobody can judge that. But when you declare a word from God or you declare it and say, thus saith God, or you stand up and even interpret a tongue and it's off base, you can be judged based on what you said. Oh, boy, i got to hurry because I said I was going to do this quick. So, so he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he prophesies edifies the church. He said, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. What he's saying here is, I, I want God to work through you so that you can be edified, but I also want him to speak through you that you can edify the body. All right? So, so I, I, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. But now, brethren... If I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sound, how will it be known what is piped or played? I've been around people that try to play an instrument, and they're just blasting away on it, and it makes no sense. But then I've heard people, like I heard last night, a guy play this electronic saxophone. When he started playing, you knew the song, what he was playing, because there was this, a distinction of notes. There was uni unity in how he was playing, and it made sense to the song. I could go back right now and hit a few notes, and I could tell you what notes I'm hitting on the keyboard, and that's as far as I can go. But Kelsey could come up here and start playing, and you'd know the song she was playing. Why? Because she's gifted to do that. I have a knowledge of it. I can tell you where middle C is, and I can point out the different notes and tell you what those notes are. But to put them together, I don't have that ability. But Kelsey does. The gifting. And so thank God that you don't have to rely on me to play this. Because our worship service was be, Mary had a little lamb, little lamb. And I'd pray to God that you'd think I was being spiritual and dance and shout to it. I bet oh, I'd probably get out of it, and I'd have to practice that two weeks to do that one song. So, so unless it makes a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is played or piped or played? So, so 
For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. If you get around people that speak foreign languages, there's significance to what they're saying. You know, it was amazing to me. I was watching a, a, a preview show of the Olympics, and they're holding them in South Korea right now. And South Korea and North Korea have come to this pact that they're going to be unified just for the games. And so they've taken North Korea players and put them with South Korea players. And even though they still speak Korean, the people from North Korea have to have an interpreter to speak to the people in South Korea because they don't understand their distinctions with even in the Korean language. Listen, I have that problem in, in, in English sometimes. <laughs> you know, my dad speaks pretty good English, and my wife would look at me and say, what did he say? You know, I understood him perfectly. She's going, <laughs> did he say something funny? Because she can't understand him. You know, when I come up here, I learned a lot of new words. I just hung, I just hung around Roger for about a week. Man, I learned all kinds of new words. Law and shoe, you know, and, and, and ewans. And I, you know, words we don't use in the good old state of South Carolina. Yuns, I, you know, I'm, I'm starting to pick up and learn these distinctions that are within the language. So even though there are these many kinds of languages, and none of them is without significance, it says. So, lost my place. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. That's what God wants us to do. God wants us to excel. He wants us to use the operation of the gifts so that we can come together. Even though we've got differences of background, differences of thought, even differences of speech, God has a way of taking a hold. Listen, that's why I love going to the Spanish church. I don't understand a thing sometimes they're saying. Every now and then I can pick out a word, and, and by the time I figured out word, what word they said, they've done moved on to something else. But when the Holy Ghost begins to move, I understand that. When they have those conferences here, and there's a thousand people in this room right here, and they're shouting and celebrating the praise of God, I'm jumping in there with them, going, glory to God, hallelujah, thank you. I don't know what you're saying, but I know what I'm feeling right now. That's the beauty of the unity of the body. Even though the language is a barrier there, God has a way of the distinction of bringing his presence and power to bring unity in the body. So therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. So when you come in here and you all of a sudden you speak out loud in, in, in tongues, you need to say, God, give me something that I can share that will edify the body and that I can interpret. You know, it's, it's sad to me because in, in most Pentecostal churches, when, when, when there's a tongue, everybody's waiting on the preacher to interpret it. The Scripture said, you pray, you interpret it. You know, it would stop a lot of stuff in churches. If, if people were held accountable. It would stop a lot of chaos and noise. And it would stop a lot of things if a minister would get up and say, all right, brother, you just spoke. Pray God give you interpretation. We're all waiting. I guarantee if he's out of order, he won't do that again. Are you with me? So he said, pray that you may interpret. If you speak in the tongue, pray that you may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For if you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all. Look what Paul's saying now. Paul's saying, I'm not, I'm not telling you. Matter of fact, he says, forbid not to speak with tongues. He tells them one place, don't you forbid it. He said, I speak in tongues more than you all. But look what he goes on to say. I speak in tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. He said, God, help me to be a difference maker in somebody else's life. You know, I, growing up and, and being a part of the church, being in ministry for the last almost 25 years now, you know, you, you see people and they come up and they just, want, they just want to speak in tongues. They want to be able to declare, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to speak in tongues. I want to speak in tongues. I'm thinking to myself, man, you've missed the mark. It's not so you can speak in tongues. It's so that you can be empowered for the, and gifted for the, for the work of the ministry. You know, this is what it's all about. It's not about so you can shout better, sing better, dance better, do whatever better. It's so that you can be effective for the kingdom of God. 
So he's teaching us this here. So that, that, that when we bless, that we bless in a way that brings edification. He says, so I thank God that I speak in tongues more than y'all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak these five words with my understanding that I may teach others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Verse 20, brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. He says, listen, I want you to be mature in this deal. Don't be like little kids, just jibber-jabbering and carrying on. I want you to speak with understanding. I want you to have an effect. I want you to make a difference. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. And yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Scary. Therefore, tongues are, a, are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Why would Paul say this? Why would Paul say that tongues are a sign to unbelievers, but yet uh, prophecy is a sign to a believer? Remember, Paul said in another place that the carnal mind cannot receive the things of the Spirit. Are you with me? So a carnal mind needs something supernatural to break that carnality so that they can actually receive the things of the Spirit. But the spiritual mind can receive the prophetic works of God and with that be able to say, Amen. So this is what Paul said. It's not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. So, verse 23, Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed, uh, uh, uninformed or, or unbelievers, will they not say that you're all out of your mind? But if I'll prophesy and an unbeliever or uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all and is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. That's the goal, folks. That's the goal, that when sinners come into our church, that they see the uniformity of the power of the Spirit, the unity of the power of the Spirit in our, in, our, in, our, in our churches and in our services, and all of a sudden they see the great works of God taking place, and they get convicted of their sin, and they fall on their face before God, and they, re they repent, and they begin to testify that God is truly here. Isn't that the goal? That should be the goal of every church. Not that we come together so that we can say we had a church service or come together so that we can say, hey, we did it, or we could check off the boxes. But it's so that sinners could come in and experience the outpouring of God's presence and be convicted of their sin and give their heart to God. So how is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be uh, two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. Again, he's giving them instruction here. He's saying, I, I, I'm tired of the chaos. I'm tired of the, 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 the spiritual uh, wildfire. I want, you, I want things to be in order. If, if, there's, a, if there's a tongue, the, the, the most let that tongue be by two or three people, and then let one person interpret so that there's no confusion to the body. I was in camp meeting one time. And this brother got up, this, and there had already been three tongues and interpretation that took place in this camp meeting service. And this fourth guy jumps up right in the middle while the man's preaching and begins to belt out tongues. And the minister said, sir, sit down, you're out of order. People got up, got mad because he called this brother down because there was other people that respected this brother. But by scripture, the man was out of order. It didn't matter if you agreed with the other three. If those were out of order, the man should have... The man, the, the, the man that was in charge could have said that tongue was out of order and, it, and, and then he could have allowed this man to be moved upon by the Holy Ghost. But when you step out of order by the Word of God, it doesn't matter what your opinion is. The Word of God is truth. And so he said, let each speak in turn and then one interpret. Why? So that there be no confusion within the body. And so he goes on to say, but if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. I don't know if you notice this. And I'm going to say a majority of the time, because I, I, if, I, if I feel the Holy Ghost about to witness through me, I'll pull my mouth closed. If I feel the Holy Ghost wanting to speak through me with gifts, I'll still put my mouth closed down when it comes out in a more distinct way. Are you with me? When people within the church, when the Holy Ghost begins to move and minister through people, you know that the Holy Ghost is about to give us a word. There's silence across the congregation. People, there, it's just a different air about the surface, surface when God begins to move in that way. I, if God is just edifying me, if the Holy Ghost is just witnessed through me, I pull my mic down, I speak to myself, and then I come back and begin to continue to prophesy or, 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 or preach forth the Word of God. 
Because if I don't feel that God's given an interpretation, but he's edifying me for the time that I'm in right then with a time with me and God, then I'll allow God to do what he wants to do in me, and then I get back about the business of the church. Are you with me? So, so you speak to yourself. So he says here, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn, all may learn and all may be encouraged. You know, I've had people come to me before and they say, Pastor, I got a word from the Lord. I say, well, tell me. Well, no, I want to share it with the church. They say, no, tell me. Tell me. You say, well, what, who do you think you are? I'm the pastor. I'm the shepherd of the body. I'm responsible for the spiritual welfare of the services when we come together and for your spiritual well-being. And again, you got to be careful who speaks into your life. If it, if it bears witness with me, then we, we, we go ahead and, and, and give it to the church. And that's order. Well, you know, we, with the Lord's moving, we don't want to slow down. You're not going to slow down the Lord. It's according to His Word. As a matter of fact, He said, if you get a word from the Lord, you keep silent until there's a, 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 a witness. And then you speak and then let the others judge. Again, if we did things in the order the way they're supposed to be, a lot of wildfire, and we don't see it much in this church, but in the church wide, well, I see a lot of it, especially when I go out, but we'd have a lot of this stuff stopped if things were brought back into order. And there'd be a lot less confusion, and there'd probably be a lot more people saved. Are you with me? We don't treat it like our own little personal circus, but we're actually doing the work of the kingdom. God help me. I'm going to get on a pet peeve here in a minute. So, so he said, listen, do this for all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. What's the scripture saying? You, you have the ability to restrain, not quench. There's a difference in quenching and allowing God to confirm. Are you with me? There's, some, there's a difference in saying, I'm just not doing it, God, or saying, okay, God, I hear you speaking, but I need to make sure I'm in order here. And so that's what he said. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So somebody come up to me and say, well, I just can't stop doing it. That's a lie. That's not you then. I mean, that's not, that's not God then. That's your flesh. For God is not the author of confusion but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. That can speak for itself. Verse 34, let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in the church. Again, Paul's dealing with issues in the Corinthian church where people are bringing heresies in because they're being led away with silly fables and silly teachings, and they're coming into the church. I also believe there's order in the church. There's order in the body of Christ. This is not a chauvinistic statement. It's a biblical statement. God said that Christ is the head of the church, Christ is the head of man, and man is the head of woman. All right? I know that that's not correct, and that's not politically correct in the days today, but that's the way the Scripture laid it out. That's when order takes place. No, listen, the Scripture teaches that no woman should usurp authority over man. I know we got independent free spirits of, of, of ladies in here, and I applaud you, but you... As according to Scripture, you don't usurp authority over man. Amen. Quiet there, but I'm hanging on. Verse 36, or did the Word of God come originally from you, or was it only out that, it, that it reached? Only, or was it you that it only reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. That's what it all boils down to, folks. In the church, in the body of Christ, and, I, and again, I, I feel like I've kind of slowed down to teach a little bit tonight, but in the body of Christ, and even with us and individuals, as we talked about this morning, God wants us to guard our lips, guard our mouth, guard our tongues, but even within the church, He wants order, He wants things decent, He wants things in order, He wants things to be in line, and with that, God can bless that kind of unity. We see what he did on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, they came together in one mind and one accord, and suddenly this move of God transpired in that upper room, and cloven tongues of fire sat upon each one of them. Each one of them. You know, my, my desire when I come to church service 
is that from, from that all across the room, when God comes and moves it, everybody begins to get a touch. We're, we're not, listen, to the point that there's not spectators, but everybody's a participator because God's touching everybody. All across the room. You know, we, I, there's times I've made this statement. I'm going to be honest with you. I said, sometimes I just get a blessing seeing somebody else get blessed. And then I stop and think about that question. Wait a minute, I want mine too. Are you with me? I mean, I think it's awesome sometimes when I see somebody that's had a need or somebody that's really fought through a trial or somebody that's really had a hard time and all of a sudden God begins to pour his blessings on them. You know, I, I get blessed out of that. You know, when Stephanie gets to worshiping and I see other people dancing this morning, people begin to worship and God begins to move. Man, I get a blessing out of that. But I'm sitting there saying, hey, God, what about me? What about me? Pour it on me, God. I want to worship. I want to praise. I want to move with God in my life. Amen. I want it to the place that when we come together, again, we come together in the unity of mind. And again, that doesn't happen just because we show up. It happens because we pray. We seek the face of God. We let God take away things that are unnecessary. We, get God, we let God pull things out of our life that are hindering. And we allow God to, to cleanse us and, and, and meticulously work through our life so that when we come together, it's, it's unity, not uniformity, unity. And the bodies come together for one purpose, and then you got people that are ears, and you got people that are eyes, you got people that are hands, you got people that are feet. And all of a sudden, just like you saw Caleb get up and walk this way, all of a sudden this body begins to operate and move under the power of God. Now, folks, this is what I'm talking about. This is life in the Spirit. It's life in the Spirit. Now, some of you, Brother Majors, pastor of the Church of God's prophecy, been in Pentecostal churches. Some of you others have been in Church of God as long as I've been alive. Uh, you know, some of you are, are just recently coming to this thing. And I, I promise you, this is probably just a little bit contrary to some of the things we've probably seen or some of the things we've probably witnessed. But I've just tried to put it all on the, on the screen so you can see that Joy just didn't sit down and make this up. This is the Word of God. I, I, again, I'm not opposed to outpouring of God's presence, God's power in the Scripture. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to throw a wet blanket on, on a move of God. But I, what I want to see is that it's not just a move of God and we walk out the building and by Monday or Tuesday it's done wore off. The move of God that took place in the upper room transformed their lives to the point that they were willing to die and did die for the cause of Jesus Christ. And what they did with that move of God that took place they, the Bible, listen, people testified in the world that they are the people that turn the world upside down. That's the kind of move of God I want. I've been in great revival services. I've preached and God's done some great things. I've seen people healed. I've seen lame people walk, deaf people hear. I've seen blind people see. I've seen people that were crippled all of a sudden take off running under the power of God. I've seen some great moves of God. And I'm telling you, friend, I've seen, I've seen miracles. I've seen, I've seen as many as 20 people saved in revival services. I've seen God do some miraculous things. But I'll tell you something. None of it means a thing if you go through the motions of the service and you go back a few months or a, few, a couple years later and you're trying to win the same people over again. That's the difference in being saved and being born again. Are you with me? When a person is born again, they're a new creation. Those old things have passed away. Listen, re remember what Jesus, Jesus didn't say except a man be saved, he won't see the kingdom of God. He said except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I'm talking about life transforming, overwhelming power of God. Moving your life in such a magnificent way. And everything about you changes. Your outlook changes. Your goals change. Your ambitions change. Your dreams change. Your desires change. Your direction changes. Because God moves in and you're no longer guiding the ship, but you've totally surrendered to Him. Even down to the fieriest of member in your body, your tongue. Are you with me? I'm believing that God has a desire for every one of us in this room to have a deeper walk with Him. And you might say, well, I'm doing pretty good. I promise you, you can do better. Thank you, Sister Sheila. You can do better. Starting with me. Every one of us can have a deeper walk with God, a, a, a kind of walk where we see the hand of God move in such a powerful way. And let me tell you something, folks. I, I, I don't believe it's by chance that God has begun to speak to my heart in, 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 in some of these things that I've been preaching on over the last several weeks. I don't believe it's by chance, especially with some of the transition that we're going through. 
some of the opportunities that we've got presented to us, almost an opportunity, a fresh start, to restart and, 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 and rekindle and refurbish and do what we need to do. Listen, I'm telling you, it all begins with Him. Amen. You know, I, I, I've been a part of churches that, that they change the name on the sign and they think that's going to give them a new identity. You can change the name on the sign, but what's on the inside, if it's still the same thing, you ain't changed nothing. You just, got, you just, you just bought you a more expensive sign. Amen. I've been asked, when are you going to put another sign over the door? I, you know, I, I'm not concerned about that sign over the door. I'd rather people know who we are based on what's going on, on the inside, not the sign that we have on the outside. Are you with me? Well, they ain't going to know where we're at. I promise you, you get a move of God going, you're going to get excited, and you're going to start talking about fire, and you're going to have those nosy people coming around saying, what meaneth this? I'm amazed. I'm perplexed. I'm confounded. I don't know what it is, but let me get in the middle of what's going on. And I'm telling you, it'll be your family members. It'll be your loved ones. It'll be your coworkers. It'll be people that you have contact with on a daily basis, and all of a sudden, they begin to come around and see it. All of a sudden, the unity of the power of God begin to move, and those sinners coming in getting curious, all of a sudden, they get convicted of their sin, and they fall down and say, God is surely among you. That's what people want, folks. They don't want just to go through a church service. There's people that are hungry in this county. There are people that are hungry in this community for a move of God. They're tired of going through the motions. They're tired of the monotonous move of God. They're tired of, of, of the monotony of church. They're tired of that stuff. They're wanting a move of God that will change them and their families for the greater good. God wants to do that. God desires to do that. And when we bring things in order and we're in unity, Man, God has the liberty to move, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Amen. Is that your desire? Would you stand with me all across the house? <laughs> if you don't mind, I'm going to testify for just a minute before we pray. I got about five minutes in this message, and it felt like somebody was stabbing me right there in my chest. But that pain's gone. I just want to give glory to God. Maybe you noticed I was pausing. I was trying to see what was going on. It just wouldn't go away. And I said, well, I'm just going to preach my way through it. Thank God that pain's gone. Praise God. I just want to give glory to God for that. But I'll tell you something. God, God has a way of doing what God needs to do to bring his people to the place that he wants to bring us to. And, again, we talked about this morning, we talked about it from an individual perspective. If they're not, we talked about it more from a corporate perspective. perspective. But the beauty of it is, there's an old saying, and I think it was A.W. Tozer that said this. He said, he said, public religion will never be what it should be until private religion is perfected. And what he was saying is, is we can come together in public, but if we've not done what we need to do in private, we'll never see what we thought we could see in the public arena. You know, you, you, you should be so fired up when you walk through the doors that you're like David. I'm going to enter his courts with thanksgiving and his gates with praise. I'm just coming in and worship God. I'm so, I'm so ready and anticipating a move of God. Man, you just come in ready and hungry. Listen, if I invited you to supper at my house tonight and you hadn't ate since uh, yesterday, you, I lay something down before you, you'd gobble it right up. You'd, you'd be right there fighting with Caleb over the chicken casserole because you're hungry. Amen. Spiritual hunger. The Bible said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. When you come in hungry and thirsty, God said, I'll fill you. I feel you. And that's what we need. We need hungry people. We need thirsty people. We need desperate people. They're saying, you know what? I, I'm not counting on next week. I got to get what I can get today. I got to get what I can get right now in this moment. On Sunday morning, I might not make it back Sunday night. The devil might try to kill me. So while I'm here, I'm going to get what I can get. And while the getting's good, I'm going to get everything I can. That's your choice, though. I mean, we could go through the motions. We can check the boxes and just say we did it. Or we can say, you know what, God? I'm hungry. I'm desperate. I'm longing for a move of your presence, God. So I want us to close in prayer tonight. And I want you to pray, God, stir up that inside of me. Because, you know, I'm not going to sit here and, and, and tell you that we're going to pray and all of a sudden God's just going to knock us all flat on our backs. He could if he wanted to. But I believe it's going to take some preparation. I believe it's going to take some desire.
I believe it's going to take some stirring up of some, some gifts. It's going to take some stirring up of some, some hunger that was deep down inside of us at one time. I believe, it's going to, I believe it's going to take the restoration of the joy of our salvation that we could get excited about the things of God again. I think it's going to take some of us saying, you know what, God, I, I, I ain't gave you my best in a long time. and I'm, It's almost been so long, God, that I, I don't even know what to give anymore. I'm so overwhelmed and burdened. I just don't know what to do. It might be that you might to say, God, you know what, put me back on the wheel. Make me over again. Restore something inside of me, God, this, that I've desperately needed for a long time. I feel that for somebody tonight. I feel that there's somebody here tonight that says, you know what, Pastor? I'd love to worship God with all my heart. I'd love to serve Him with all my heart. But, man, it's been so long. What, what, what I had one time is just not there anymore. I'm telling you, my God specializes in restoration. He specializes in rebuilding. He specializes in taking that which, which the, world and the, the, the world and the enemy and the flesh have torn down. He specializes in rebuilding those things. If I had time, we could go through the book of Nehemiah as he stood and looked at the rubbish and the broke down walls of Jerusalem. But he stood and began to weep over that city. He, he began to pray and he said, God, let your ear be attended to the prayer that's being made in this place. God, I see what they've done. And all of a sudden, he put every man in a position on the wall and they began to work what was on in front of them and they began to build the wall. The enemy stood on the outside declaring, look, what they're trying to build, even if a fox runs across the top of it, it'll collapse. But yet they focused in. They didn't listen to what the, the taunts were. They didn't listen to what other people were saying. They just focused on what was before them. And they built that wall. Come on, folks. This is what we're here for, to restore that which has been broken down. So restore that which has been. And we get our life back in the fullness of the Spirit of God. Where we don't get perturbed and tore out of frame when, when the world makes a report or an accusation against us. We don't get all messed up when people begin to say all manner of things against us. But we stand firm. We stand steady. We stand balanced because we know in whom we believe. And we're persuaded that he's able to keep us. That's life in the spirit. That's life in the spirit. I want to be led by the spirit. I want to walk in the spirit. I want to talk in the spirit. I want my life to be consumed and overwhelmed and rushed by the Spirit of God. As you can tell, I'm concluding this series to this tonight. But I want you to know that this is what God wants us to have, to be filled with the Spirit of God. The first step can begin tonight for you to begin to say, God, start in me. Whatever I got to take off, whatever I got to get rid of, whatever I got to shed, whatever I got to move forward with, and whatever I got to leave behind, God, start in me tonight restore something deep inside of my heart and my life God that I can begin to be more effective for you and I can begin to walk in the fullness of your spirit let's bow our heads Father all across this room and I don't know who you're speaking to specifically as it concerns the one that needs a restoration there's somebody here in this room God that they battled for a long time They've watched other people shout. They've watched other people worship. They've watched other people see the, get the prayers answered. They've, they, they've seen other people that are connected with them that, that seem to just, you know, go through the trial and come out victorious. And they, yet in, in, in their life, they felt like it's been a consistent struggle. Lord, you told them in the book of Revelation the strength of the things that remained. You told them to go back to their first love. God, I believe sometimes you tell us to, to go back to where it all began. I, I think about that song, I believe it was Andre Crouch uh, that, or Walter Hawkins, one of those guys that wrote the song, Take Me Back, Take Me Back, God, to where I first met you. Sometimes I pray that myself, God. I just go into a time of prayer and I ask you to save me all over again. Sanctify me, make me clean, fill me with the Holy Ghost. Call me again, Lord. Let me hear your voice that I can hear it with clarity. Once again, there may be people here tonight that say, you know what, God? I can't keep going the direction I'm going. I can't li keep living the way I'm living. Something's got to change in me. God, I'm giving you my all. I'm giving you my very best. Lord, all across this room, as we've gone through this word today and we've talked about individual responsibility. We talked about corporate responsibility as it pertains to the move of the Spirit. 
I pray, Lamb of God, that you would touch every person that's in this room, even those that are watching online. God, that you would just burn a desire and a hunger inside of them. God, that when we come together, that they're hungry and thirsty. When they're alone in their prayer time, they're hungry and they're thirsty. When they're having devotional time with their family, that they're hungry and they're thirsty. And when they're hungry and thirsty, God, your word declares that they shall be filled. Restore the joy of their salvation. Restore that desire and that hunger to serve you, God, and unashamedly to serve you, God, with all their heart, their soul, their mind, their strength, to love you with everything that's within them. Begin all across this room, I pray, in the name of Jesus, to stir up those gifts that are within us. God, that we could be everything you called us to be. I love you, Lamb of God. I give you praise for this day. You've been so good to us. Cannot thank you enough for the great things that you've done. This seed's gone forth, and I pray this seed is falling on good ground. Let it take root. Let it bring forth fruit. Lord, let it be mingled with their faith. Let it grow like a great tree that even the birds of the air would plant their nest in. Give shade. God, let it make a difference in their lives and the lives of those that they're connected to. We're believing and trusting, God, that you're going to do great things. I want to thank you for this opportunity of transition. I want to thank you for this opportunity that the word of the Lord can come a second time, just like it did to Jonah. I want to thank you, Lord, for bringing us out of this, this, this seemingly dark place over the last couple of years. For bringing us through, God, and helping things to be a turnaround, God. We're anticipating great things. Lord, that you're going to help us to be revived, and refreshed, renewed, in the fullness of who you are. Thank you, Lord. Let it begin in me. Lord, I, I, I don't pray for anybody else in this room right now, but God, let it begin in me. Restore vision. Restore purpose. Restore desire, hunger. God, a, a burden, a burden for people, a burden for the lost, a burden for ministry. Restore that inside of me, God. I can make the vision plain so that they that read it can read it and run with it. God, that I can be the pastor I need to be for the perfecting of these saints, for the working of the ministry. That they can go forth and lay hands on the sick and they can recover. That they can go forth and cast out devils. That they can go forth and preach the gospel and, and the lost be saved. God, that they can do the work of the ministry. As I do my part, they do their part, God, and we all work together. God, Paul planted Apollos water, but God, you give the increase. We all have our part to play. Let us do it, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. I love these folks. I thank you so much for the the privilege to serve them as their pastor. I pray that you bless them as they go tonight. Keep them safe. Bring us back at the next appointed time. God, we're going to love you. We're looking forward to a great time in you. For all that's done and all that's accomplished, we'll praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you, church. I love you so much. Appreciate you. Hope you do good. Go out and fight some devils and win souls. Amen? Amen. God bless you.